Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic. In this video, we pick out your questions from the comments section down below. We try and answer them as best we can. This week, Hank, you're in the mix. Right, take it away with our first question. I'm gonna do my very, very best to help you all out there, but if I don't know the answer, don't hold it against me because luckily I've got the nerd. You have know the answer, have faith. faith in yourself. <laughs> Okay, Come do on. This. Anyway, kicking off with Jason Lowe. Hello, Alex, Ollie, and Manon. Cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll read out the questions. <laughs> I'll read out the questions. <laughs> I'm fortunate to find some new old stock Speedplay Zero Aero pre Wahoo for a very reasonable price. When I need to replace the cleats down the line, would they be compatible with the new Wahoo Speedplay cleats? Yes. That was an easy one. Easy one to start you off. They are going to be compatible, yeah. They're interchangeable with the Speedplay brand and stuff yeah. and the new Wahoo brand and stuff. That's Fantastic. it. That was Much an easy love start. to you also <laughs> in Canada. Next question is from Ian Mega G's. I just bought. Ian Mega G's! <laughs> yeah? I That's think... how you say it. Okay. I just bought a second hand Ridley Phoenix nice. with fully integrated cables, 105 disc brakes. The stem is a little bit high. I want to cut the steerer down. Yeah. For that, I need, I guess, I need to pull the cables out on the head because the headset spaces aren't two parts. Do, oh, it's their first disc bike, and they're wondering what kind of special tools they need. Do they need olives and a bleeding kit, I assume? Well, I'll dive straight into this. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, the last time I bled brakes was yeah. on my motocross bike, and it went horrifically wrong. So um, uh, I okay. reckon you should take this question. So yeah, if the spacers aren't two-piece, that means you've got to take the stem off, you've got to disconnect the cables, and you've got to disconnect the, the brake hoses, and then slide the spacers all the way off. So if you're lucky, you're going to be able to get the... You don't the, have to cut the top of the hoses off. Yeah, right? if you're lucky, you haven't got to cut the hoses off and you can thread yeah. it all through. And then, in that instance, you should be able to put it all back together and you might not have to bleed the brakes. However, if you've got to chop the ends of the hoses off, you're going to need new olives and new compression fitting. Yeah. And the little barb that goes inside, sorry. So olive and compression fitting, it's kind of the same thing. And the barb that goes in the end, you're going to need some of those. And then you are going to need to bleed the brakes once you... But really it is good practice it. to bleed the brakes, right? It's good practice, yeah. It's a maintenance job you should do every year or two. Um, yeah, once you've got it all back together, or if you've you should got be fine. Good friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then drop um, them off there. So, right. okay, that clears that up. Right, next question is from MPS. Hank, take MPS. it away. MPS, how much faster, how much less effort would I have to put in? Three-ish months ago, I bought a, myself a cheap Decathlon RC500 road bike, set it up for bike packing, added, you know, Brooks Adder, Schwabby Marathon tires and a bunch of bags. So basically, I made the bike a bit heavier and slower. It came with 28 millimeter generic race tires. These comfort upgrades all frame and saw a group set make it However, 11 kilograms. Yeah, 11 kilograms. Now, I got bitten yeah. by that bug like we all have yeah. and want to upgrade. Currently looking at 8 ish kilograms, carbon right, gravel bike. Since I ride every fire road, I find the question is how much faster for much less effort would I have to put in? Currently hoovering around the 20. Hoovering. <laughs> hovering. <laughs> hoovering. Just hovering around the 25 kilometers per hour mark uh, on a flat 65 mile ride. Well, long, can I, can long I, question. Can so I kick this in? Kick this in. Basically, I could slim this question down. Is it worth spending £3,000 on a gravel bike? Watch your knee. Go on then, what are your thoughts, your thoughts? Should they invest their money yes. into a gravel bike? Do you so think so? You should Go on. No, I, if we're looking at more speed on the flat, yeah. sitting at 25 kilometers per hour, yeah. I'd look at body position as well. Yeah, I think you know, body making position. yourself more aero. 25k yeah. is actually pretty fast. Yeah. So having good position on the bike without even doing anything to your bike is going to really help your average speed. Yeah, I'm completely with you on that. Um, buying a new bike that's lighter is obviously going to help you ride a little bit faster. But there are lots of areas you can look at which are either going to be free or a lot cheaper to do. So like I said, body position. So you've got handlebar stem, look at different tyre options, tire remove pressures. tire pressures, remove any unnecessary stuff yeah. off your bike so that you're lugging around. That is going to speed up your existing bike and really help you out. And if you're taking bike packing bags, you know, pack the essentials if you want to go fast. Yeah, yeah. You know all about packing light, don't Pack you? light, trust me. <laughs> right, okay. Let's, let's just say you don't get enough sleep, but you go fast. Next question is from Brian W. They say, should I wash my bike? I recently picked up my bike from the shop for maintenance and asked the guy at the shop how often I should wash my bike. His response was to never take a garden hose to it and just use dry rags and clean it that way. Right, can I kick this off? Yep, you go. Because 
How I wash a bike is definitely with water. You know, I tend to get some some, some lukewarm water, yeah. some, you know, muck, soap, muck off soap, degreaser. chuck it in there, mix it in, wash it off, get degreaser on the oily parts, and then wash it with a garden hose. And then you can buff it up with some, some polish. Yeah, I would say a clear, well cleaned and maintained bike, which you're washing regularly after you know, a few rides in the dry, or if it's a wet, muddy ride straight away afterwards. It's really gonna help your bike and all its components last a lot longer and work a lot better. Exactly. Yeah, I wouldn't wipe it down with no. just a dry rag. No, how are you gonna even clean it properly? I know, next question, Rupert McLeod. He says, hey guys, lots of advice, tells me to run low tire pressures, say five bar, yet my Mavic UST's tires say not to go below six bar, which is printed on the sidewall. This happens with lots of other tires and brands. Will they fall off if I run them below the pressure? Is the manufacturer being cautious? And apparently it's a subtly different question to mm. one asked a few weeks ago. Well, in my, my sort of opinion, safety is the most important thing. If the tires or the wheels have got a minimum pressure or a maximum pressure written on, it's important not to go below that or exceed it. Now, in the instance that we're talking about here, your tires say six bar minimum, therefore don't go below six bar. The tire bead isn't designed to be secure enough onto the wheel at pressures below that. I don't think it's that your tire's just gonna immediately fall off if you went just below that because there is a safety margin built in, but I wouldn't recommend going lower than what's written on the side of your tires. I would second that. Thanks. Living nicely put, buddy. Oh, thanks very much. Next question. Sydney away. Dutton, do you think it's better for me to get a second-hand bike uh, with high spec, but a slightly older one, or should I get a brand new bike with lower spec? Now, mm. I would 100% go for a slightly, a second hand, but better spec, because you can change the chain and you can change the actual durable parts, you know, the brake pads and all that kind of stuff, yeah. to, to actually make it feel like a newer bike. And that way you, you, you kind of like... Well, because you can pick some bargains up, can't you? Yeah, and you can at least, you know, you, you want an upgrade real quick. And if you get, if you get a bargain basement bike, then you're kind of stuck with it for a bit. So um, I'm inclined to agree with you on that. I would say if you shop around and find some yeah. a used bike that's in good condition, you can get something which is maybe a price point you might not have been able to afford if yeah, it was exactly. brand new. The one thing I would say though is buying second hand is make sure you really look over that bike before you purchase it. Um, so I definitely suggest you go and have a look at it. You make sure if you're buying carbon you know, a yeah. carbon frame to make sure there's no cracks or there's no dents or, you know, a make sure- inspection. Make sure the, the bike's really good, uh, in good condition before we purchase it. Okay, next question, Leonardo. Bonizzato. I said that without moving my mouth then. How... Bonizzato. You, you mime it, not... Bonizzato. <laughs> I think that was awful. Was it? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, they say, I was taking a look at the differences between entry road bike pedals and the most expensive ones. At first glance, the main difference appears to be the weight. How does that translate into pedaling? Will having less rotational inertia mean that you can reach and sustain higher cadences before? No, I don't think the weight of your pedals is drastically going to change the rate of your, your cadence. Your RPM. No, I don't think it is. The weight of your pedals is going to have a noticeable difference to the overall weight of your bike. Exactly. That's going to help you ride a little bit faster uphill, but it's not going to be a game changer if you ask me. Totally agree with you, Alex. Um, one Hugo. thing, one oh, thing to consider at premium pedals though, is quite often they'll have better quality bearings and seals, so they should stay nice and smooth for a little bit longer. Hmm. Top tip. Right, we've got one in from Hugo Trudel. Hi, DigiCM presenters. Whoever is hosting the show this week, thank <laughs> <laughs> Alex, I've noticed that uh, when you are doing a hub sound check to use the left brake lever to stop the rear wheel. I live in Canada and here I have never seen such a setup on all bikes. I've okay, basically what they're saying is... Um, uh, are we know, the only people who use left hand? left hand front brake? Um, I think the UK is the only place that uses that, left hand right? rear brake. Left hand rear brake, sorry. Yeah, no, left hand rear brake. UK is the only place, I think, in yeah. Europe and the rest of the world rear brakes on the right hand lever and lots of bike frames are designed to be the hoses rooted that way. Why on earth do we do that? What do you use? Um, I have left left brake um, is the rear brake. Yeah. yeah, me too. And now I have it because I've actually come from motorbikes from back yeah. in the day when I was on motocross bikes. And so I was just so ingrained to using the the uh, right front because right for the front because I had the left hand as my clutch. So motorbike back brake is on, on left the foot. left foot right foot right foot. 
Um, well, I guess that kind of makes sense talking about it from a motorbike perspective. So if you, if you do cycle and ride motorbikes, it'll make a lot of sense. Um, but otherwise, it's just one of the weird things we do here in the UK. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We're a funny old bunch. Um, that was our last question of this week. Hank, it's been amazing. Thanks for sharing all your insightful tech knowledge with us and everybody at home. I've enjoyed it. Have you enjoyed it? I've absolutely loved it. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. And don't forget, if you have any questions, I'm sure you do, to get them into Alex and Ollie, and they will answer your questions. But for me and Alex, see you later. See you later. Bye.